Yes, welcome. Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church in Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be the minister with this congregation of all ages at all stages of life. We have gathered together as an intentional community to support each other into living our mission of embracing freedom, loving inclusively, growing in mind, body, or spirit, and adding to the wholeness and the healing of the world. And in living our mission, we recognize the networks of relationships of which we are a part in so many ways. We are part of a deeply interconnected and profoundly beautiful web. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They assisted the first European settlers uh, as they came down the Illinois River. We honor the Peoria people for who they were and for who they are today. I want to thank folks for joining us in person and online. It is truly uh, an act of courage and boldness in some ways to say, yes, I need community. Yes, we are better together. And to that end, we gather. Uh, and if you are new to our community, please help us get to know you. Uh, name tags, we have ushers and greeters. And also please stay after the service and stay for fellowship. Whether you are here with us in person or whether you are on Zoom, please join us. And let me offer this moment uh, to invite folks to turn devices into worship mode. Take the magic wand and go poof into worship mode. Oh no, buttons. Buttons would be better, I'm sure. Um, so we put those in vibrate or silent. That would be really helpful. Thank you. And if you need help, I'm sure we have people who can advise and help on how to help with that uh, going forward. Yes, I hear a yes. Okay. See, we minister in so many ways, right? We minister in so many ways. 
So I want to offer a note about today's service. A number of the elements of the service will be led by the children, youth, and families of this congregation. We are exploring this month the theme of finding our center. And in doing that, the worship committee and I thought this would be a wonderful moment to invite uh, some of our longest term members and to offer a little bit of words of wisdom, or at least experience. And uh, I want to thank Bob and Sherry Dearborn, Pat Harris, and Karen Zichterman for being our guests today. This is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So a couple of notes uh, going forward. There is uh, a organizational meeting of the music ministry trying to revise and revamp the music ministry. Um, this is the where we go out to members of the congregation who can't, who have a hard time getting out and play something lovely or sing a little song with them. Uh, you can see Bernie Humphrey uh, for that after about noon or so, I think in the fourth and fifth grade room. Uh, and a couple of other announcements. One, this coming Saturday night marks the return of the chili cook-off. Yes, the chili cook-off. I know, you've been waiting for that heartburn to return. I know you have. Come on. Yes. And good stuff. And also, of course, good food, of course. And uh, so I want to invite folks to sign up and be cooks. You can sign up and uh, you can talk to Joyce Rosenberger if you'd like to be helpful, useful. No committee meetings, just ask what's needed and maybe get something done and that would be a great service too. Uh, so next Saturday evening, let us gather together and enjoy some good food and some good company. Uh, let's see, next Sunday service is a little bit uh, special. We feature the Reverend Craig Schwallenberg uh, from... Uh, he will be coming to us live from his home in Oneata, New York. We have the magic of space and time uh, at our hands these days. Uh, Reverend Craig is someone who has had years of experience in parish ministry, and he's now developing a game ministry, a game ministry, and it is growing. And we, we get to explore our imaginations with him next week. So please join us. And also, most particularly and specially, next Sunday after the service, <clears throat> we celebrate Jan Force. Jan is finishing off her 18 years or so of work as the office manager in this congregation as such a hub and a center of life and making everything work. I swear, if there's magic, it is in how she does all the things. Um, and I want to welcome everybody to join us in celebrating her retirement. Uh, people have asked, you're welcome to make a donation if you'd like to help contribute to a financial gift for her. Cards are also welcome and will be available next Sunday as well. And if you would like to assist with a couple of the details to make things happen, please see me or Terry Matthews. And I think, I think we will leave it there. We have such good and wonderful things happening in the life of our congregation in so many ways. It is such a joy to be so gathered. And in that spirit, please join me in rise in body or spirit for our opening hymn, number 361, Enter, Rejoice, and Come In.
And let me invite Bill Ordaz and Isaac Ordaz come forward for our opening. Of belonging and caring. By Reverend Kimberly Ann Tomchek Carlson. It's not by chance that you arrived here today. You've been looking for something larger than yourself. Inside, there's a yearning, a calling, a hope for more, a desire for a place of belonging and caring. Through your struggle, someone nurtured you into being, instilling a belief in a shared purpose, a common yet precious resource that belongs to all of us when we share. And so you began seeking a beloved community, a people that does not put fences around love, a community that holds its arms open to possibilities of love, a heart home to nourish your soul and share your gifts. And let me invite Ben Keister for our chalice. In this small flame dwell by Rev. Jean L. Wallstorm. In this small flame dwell the beacon light of lanterns guiding travelers home. The warmth of heart fires tended through the generations, the transforming energy of furnaces and the power and life of our sun. May these blessings warm the light, warm the light and life giving energy be kindled in each of us.
Let me invite forward uh, our membership coordinator, Gina Stanley, and board president, Linda Fairbanks. And also, I want to invite, we have a, some members who are being recognized as part of joining within the past year or so. So let me invite Heather McMeekin and George Hopkins forward as well. So we gather in church seeking a higher purpose and a deeper life than we could find alone. We are grateful today for each one of you that you have found your way home here and that you decided to make a commitment with this faith community. We hope that as a member of the church, you will allow yourselves to be known and to know and be known uh, to, the, to minister to and to be ministered unto and to love and be loved by the congregation, by the entirety of the body. The relationships we form in church are based on the needs of the Spirit, and these needs render us each vulnerable and therefore reliant on one another's grace and goodness and generosity. And as members of the congregation, we all get to be guardians of each other's struggle and our inherent worth. So these two members have joined in the past year, uh, Heather McMeekin and George Hopkins. And we are all in this together. So will the congregation please rise in body or spirit and join with our newest members in affirming our mutual commitments to one another. In your order of service, there are um, a, few, a few things for you to say. Uh, join me in that, please. We embrace freedom. We welcome and love all. We grow in mind, body, and spirit. We contribute to the healing of the world. We, the members of the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria, are committed to these ideals and invite you to join us in this commitment. We share your commitment and accept your invitation. We covenant to nurture one another, to inspire one another, to enrich our congregational life by participating, leading, and giving, and to celebrate life in all of its diversity, beauty, and creativity. We welcome you into our beloved community of memory and hope. May we, the members of this congregation, remain faithful to our mutual commitments through all the ages and stages of life. We welcome you into this community with all our hearts.
Now I'd like to invite the Jones family forward for offering our offering. Ask. The living of our mission, embracing freedom, loving inclusively, growing in all ways, and adding to the wholeness of the world, shows up in the many gifts we share, volunteering, using our particular skills, and our financial gifts. We take up a collection every week in worship as a way to honor the act of giving. An offering of money is a way to be intentional, tangible, present in the life and work we share and keep sustaining. We send some of our offering into the world and we practice share the plate. Half of the undesignated offering will be shared with our named recipient while half goes to the church. Our first recipient in 2023 is Lula NFP. Lula is a Peoria outreach, outreach team that daily provides food, temporary shelter, clothing, sleeping bags, blankets, bus passes, and other items crucial for survival for people living outside on the streets or in tent encampments. All have experienced significant trauma in their lives and most suffer with some form of mental illness. Lula also provides assistance in navigating available resources such as housing and medical care. They receive no government funding and rely solely on private donations. They are a 501c3 charitable organization. LulaPeoria.com, Facebook, Lula NFP. If your offering is toward a pledge, please indicate that in the memo line or on an offering envelope. Again, half of the undesignated offering will go to share, go to share the plate and half will go to the church. Thank you for your generous gifts. The ushers will pass the plates, then will be the time for lighting the candles of care. The morning offering will, gratefully be, will be gratefully received. Will the ushers please come forward?
May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but connected in mystery and miracle to the universe, to this community, and to each other. This is the time for the sharing of joys and sorrows in the congregation. I want to begin with a note of thanks and joy to everyone who supported or attended uh, the congregation's first ever drag story hour yesterday. Uh, Speak Out Illinois organized and provided staff for the event. Our performers, our partnership worked very well um, about 40 adults and 14 children and youth attended. And I want to thank the, our excellent performers for doing such a great job with telling the stories and also talking and engaging with the children. Um, thank you for, uh, to Ruth Rademacher and Tim Harold for the banned books display. And thank you for the church uh, youth and volunteers who prepared a bake sale to benefit the Trevor Project as well. We had a truly wonderful time, and it was an excellent event just to gather, and it went all well, so yay. We have a number of notes for wishes for health. Uh, For Phyllis Close, who is recovering at home following surgery, to Pat Colfield, who was hospitalized with injuries received from a fall. Uh, We also offer uh, prayers of health to Joe Lakota, who was home with a leg injury and long COVID, unfortunately. Um, We offer our care and concern for uh, the friend of Mary Mahalan Kafar, who asked for prayers for her friend Deborah's brother, who is in the final stages of dementia, and all of the family that is with them and surrounding them in this time. We have several notes of sorrow as well. Uh, We have the sorrow of the passing of Laura Beneventi. Uh, Laura is a sister to Kelsey Howard. Kelsey is the daughter of Steve and Linda Fairbanks. We also offer uh, our sympathy and support to Kat, who is the partner of Bear Flintgruber. Uh, Kat lost to illness and death the loving mother of their nephew, who is one. So we offer our wishes and blessings to baby Alex and daddy Yao, what a horrible loss, and so early and so young. We also offer a note of sympathy to Barbara Pierce, uh, as she and her family mourn the loss of Barbara's sister, Glenna Howard, age 81, uh, who was in Peoria. Glenna died on January 16th. And also we offer a note of loss and mourning to Ellie and Pat Colfield, who mourn the passing of Pat's sister, Marianne Goffels of Galesburg. Marianne died on January 16th as well. And I offer a note for our larger world that is not so far away this time. A week ago on Sunday, <clears throat> someone set fire to the Planned Parenthood of Peoria. And the Planned Parenthood will now be closed for some months. Many folks in our community, including those who are lesbian, gay, transgender, and plus, and folks who are black, indigenous, and people of color, will not have the health care they need as a result. This act was also meant to instill fear. Let us extend our circles of care to those who serve this agency and to those who need the services they provide. I invite you to pause with me for one more moment of quiet. 
I invite you to be present to this time in this place and to breathe in and out with me. Let us enter a moment of quiet together. Amen, shalom, and namaste. As we enter into our hymn, From You I Receive to You I Give, I want to invite the folks who are joining us being our guests for a conversation to come forward as well, so you have plenty of time. And let me just check. I know the children and youth know this hymn fairly well. It's partially why we were including it today. But is this a hymn the congregation knows? Let me, if I can see, raise of hands. Well, gosh darn it, we get to learn new things. All right. This is really, really a very simple one, I promise. And you've probably heard me say it, sing it in at least once or twice in a moment of things. And it's number 402. It's a very simple couplet. And I'm going to offer it in whatever key that shows up for me, but listen to the key in the piano when we come to sing. Just so you know. Just so you know. Fair enough. Let me just do, let me, hmm? You want it again? Well, give me just a moment. Let me just do whatever key shows up and then it'll get, you'll all get the idea. Oh, no, no, not that key. (laughs) From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. Okay, but now we go to the key that she wants because that's the key that's in the book. And I'll give it a try, but I'm not promising. From Yeah. <laughs> what we'll do is we will sing once, we'll listen to it once, and then we will sing it through four times together, and that will help get the flow. Okay? And please rise and body your spirit because that opens up the body. All right, now, please.
one at a time. We'll figure it out. All right. So this morning, we are gifted with the presence of some of the long-term members of our congregation who agreed to come and join us and respond to the questions that I have given them ahead. And we'll have some of our youth ask the questions as we go. But let me offer a note from Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. He reminds us, in a house which becomes a home, one hands down, another takes up the heritage of mind and heart, laughter and tears, musings and deeds. Love, like a carefully loaded ship, crosses the gulf between generations. We live not by things, but by the meanings of things. It is needful to transmit the passwords from generation to generation. So for exploring our theme of finding our center, the worship committee and I thought we would love to hear from some of the members of the congregation. And our children and youth will be asking the questions as we go. And these excellent members will be offering their responses for the benefit of the children and for us. So I want to thank Bob and Sherry Dearborn and Pat Harris and Karen Zichterman for agreeing to be with us today. And... Let me start with the first question. Becca, would you start with that question? What brought you to the church, Unitarian Universalism? Universalism. Do you want us to go for more? Oh, here. Uh -huh. yeah. Not that I didn't know the question ahead of time, <laughs> but I'm sorry I had to have a script with me because I get memory glitches, and I couldn't picture myself saying, now where was I? And somebody, you know, so I'm doing this. Okay. The question, oh, I do wave my arms around, but I can't hold it. That's okay, I think, unless I go out. Okay. <laughs> And the question was, what brought you to the church? So it was 1968. My husband, Warren, and I had participated in civil rights demonstrations and marches and was very involved. Oh, I, I should hold this up. Okay, I'll be in charge. <laughs> but your arm will get tired. Okay. You heard me say we participated in civil rights movement demonstrations and marches, and we were very involved in the peace movement. So um, we would get together with other peaceniks and talk, if you can imagine. Well, one of the things we talked about was the churches we belonged to and how most of them were not participating or supporting civil rights or world peace. Tom Edwards, a longtime member of this church, invited us to try out the UU church. Jim Haefeli, a short time member of this church, also encouraged us to give UUs a chance. So the first Sunday we came to the church on Hamilton Boulevard, we walked in with our five daughters. Our oldest, Margaret, was six years old, and our youngest, Michelle, was our new baby, three weeks old. They were all wearing lacy headscarves and genuflecting. Joni did it backwards. Now, some you use may not know what a genuflection is, so I'll explain it. It's when you go down on one knee. I would demonstrate, but I wouldn't be able to get up again, I think. So anyhow, after the service, people kept coming up to us and saying, you're from the Catholic Church, right? So how'd they know? <laughs> <laughs> that was the same Sunday our good friends, Larry and Mary Matthews, also attended. They had nine children. So in one Sunday, two families added 18 more people. We stayed through good times and bad times through happy and sad times, and now it's 55 years later. Okay. 
Hi. So the question is, what brought you to the UU Church? And then my response would be, who brought me? Because it was my parents when I was like five or six years old. I can't really remember then. But um, my parents had moved into a neighborhood, and everybody in the neighborhood belonged. You know, on Sunday, it used to be that everybody went to church, or on Friday night, they went to the synagogue. Not many people didn't belong to anything. So we joined one church, and it was a traditional Christian Protestant church. Um, That didn't work well for my parents. So I don't know who recommended that they come to this church, but somehow we got here. And it became like the focus of our life. We did um, as, as our social life. I think my mom was involved with a lot of the same things that Pat had been involved with, only this was earlier. This would have been in the late 50s and 60s. The ACLU and the NAACP. Yeah. Um, so we did everything with that group of people. There were scientists from the egg lab that we got to be friends with, and we would all go out to eat afterwards to the Methodist cafeteria, Methodist hospital, big. Um, so that was then, and then I grew up and didn't come to church and went to college and then moved to Chicago. Mike and I got married, and we started having children. And we're back in Peoria, still not going to any church. We were tired. Um, Then my daughter, who was about five or six at the time, was invited by one of the neighbors from her best friend, and they said, hey, can Anna come to vacation Bible school with us? I was like, I was tired. I had a baby at home. I was like, sure, what what could go wrong? So she went to vacation Bible school, and it was just a nice little Christian church, very nice, nice little place. I had no idea they would be telling her things like this. She came home crying. And she's like, they said that Annie is going to go to hell because she's Jewish. And I was like, what? And I explained to her that they were lying to her and that there was no hell and that that you're not going back to that vacation Bible school. Um, So that was during the summer. And I think we, I brought Anna back to the UU church and was so happy. And that's, and we've been here ever since. So. Well, I'm originally from um, Cleveland. Well, actually, originally, never mind. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, and I had joined the UU Church there. And uh, I sang in the choir there for quite quite a while, and then met this guy, and uh, and moved here. So um, I've been a UU for a long time, and uh, it's been interesting because my thoughts have changed. And um, they still change, and I'm not sure where I am right now. I'm still a UU, but uh, things come and go, and I'm okay with that. Um, What brought me to the church was my husband at that time, who was doing, he was a teacher, and he was doing a class on different religions, and UU was one. And I went to the UU church, and I went with him, and I thought it was interesting, so I kept going. So so it's been a long time search for me, and I'm still searching and enjoying it. I'm going to stand up here because I'm nervous, and this feels more comfortable to me. Um, I um, grew up in a small Protestant, liberal, very liberal Protestant church. And when we were in junior high, we spent a year studying the different Christian denominations. When we got to unitar- universalism and Unitarianism, it's like, gee, that's me. And so later, um, after I was grown, when, when I moved, went to look for another church, I immediately came to the UU Church in Peoria. And there were two things in particular, <coughs> excuse me, two things in particular that drew me here when I got there. When I first walked into the sanctuary, 
above the above the um, here was a large arch, and on it were the words, "The Universal Brotherhood of Man, the Universal Fatherhood of God." And those words spoke to me. Um, later, later, the congregation had them erased because it was um, because of the sexism of the words and that. But at that time, I was oblivious to that. But what it really was telling, <coughs> excuse me, was telling me was. It spoke to how we are all, all people, just one family. And that all peoples and the earth and all of its creatures, we should, <clears throat> we should treat with love and caring. The second thing that drew me here and kept me here was how welcome I felt and how welcoming the congregation was. And in particular, one man, Warren Harris, who was Pat's husband, welcomed to me, took time, and he welcomed every, everybody who came in, every newcomer, not just once, but every week. Got to know them introduced them to other people, and it just felt very welcoming. It felt like home. And I want to, I don't do that as well as he did, and there are other people who have been doing that here, but I want to invite all of you to do the same thing, to aspire to welcome all newcomers, to get to know them, and to welcome not, not once, but week after week, because... Um, as um, my son would say, a stranger or somebody new is just a friend that you haven't met yet. So, thank you. This one. What created your emotional, spiritual, and moral center? Thank you, Nate. Definitely the Catholic Church. We were a very practicing Catholic family, mass not only on Sundays, but sometimes daily, and confession every Saturday, whether we thought we had sinned or not. I have a memory of my brothers being called in from play on a Saturday afternoon, having to take a bath and change their clothes. And one brother, Jack, <laughs> you, he went to school with him. My brother, Johnny, kept saying, I don't have any sins to confess. He tried over and over to convince my parents that he hadn't sinned, nothing to confess. Well, they insisted that he go anyhow. And so I swear, as he's finally going out the door, I heard him mumble, well, I guess I'm just going to have to sin all the way over. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I pictured, do you throw rocks or look in windows? I never knew what sinning on the way over to church meant, but that's what it was. So, I, Oh, and then my father also influenced me very much. Um, he gave us lectures, sermons. We dreaded them. However, I wound up doing the same thing with my daughters. And one time, one of them came to me and said, Mom, we've decided, why don't you just spank us like other parents do? <laughs> and then it wouldn't take so long. <laughs> so anyhow, that's it. That's it. Well, mine was different, <laughs> um, but I think we all probably began developing our moral center and our sense of right or wrong uh, religious views 
with our families and with our, um, our upbringing, our relatives, where we live. So in my house, um, it was unusual, I think, in that my father was Midwestern, apostolic Christian families, you know, from Princeville and Goodfield. And um, my mother was from New York City. And um, her, ra- her uh, grandfather was, it was her great-grandfather, was a rabbi in Lithuania. So we had the, the Ashkenazis and the apostolics. And they found their place in the UU church, thank goodness, um, because it's, um, you know, you learn from all the religions in UU church, and neither of my parents were invested in their religions that they were raised in, so that was good. But I think as a young adult or with my, when I brought my children and started teaching Sunday school here, um, I began to, you know, re- realize that I was raised um, by two parents who were actually uh, what did Jean Sloniger call her husband? An evangelical atheist. Um, so they were very um, adamant that there was no supernatural. Um, I was looking around for little kids. I was never allowed to believe in Santa Claus or Easter Bunny or anything like that. So everything was fact-based. Everything was uh, science-related. Um, so that was, that was where I started from. And then coming here as a parent and paying more attention to what I was being taught here, um, I became exposed, I think, to humanism, which would be that, you know, humans, the answers are either within the human population or uh, according to scientific method and that we are comfortable without knowing the answers to everything. We just haven't learned them yet. They haven't been discovered yet. We're not going to listen to make up, made up stories or myths to explain things we don't understand. So that was very comfortable to me. And then we're, we just keep coming back to Pat. Pat and Warren, um, I think, exposed or helped us all understand the teachings of Robert Ingersoll, who was, in my mind, a great, you know, I mean, he was called an agnostic, but he was an atheist. Um, a believer in humanism, that the time to be happy is here and the time to be happy is now. And the way to make other people, the way to be happy is to make other people happy. And I just, that just resonated with me. So I think that's where I found my center. I, um, when I was growing up, we didn't really go to church. My folks went to church, and after a certain while, they insisted that we go to church. So we attended, but we sat with them as kids in the, in the pews. We didn't go to Sunday school until they had classes for people who were getting ready to join the church. So we went to those. And it's just my sister and I. I don't know if she went to them or not, but I went to them. She didn't. Okay. Um, I didn't get a lot out of it. And I remember the person teaching it, I think it's, he was the assistant minister, asked um, some question, and you're supposed to say yes to it because it was something all people did in church. And I, I said no. And, and, and it was like, do you pray? And I said, no. Um, and I said, I just, it didn't talk to me. I, I just didn't. And he kept trying to get me to say yes. I kept saying no. Um, but they let me join the church anyway. And uh, I went to church and I listened to the sermons and all. I never got much out of it. It never did much for me. I think it was Presbyterian. Um, It just didn't didn't reach me. Um, And I went to Sunday school once in a while because I was supposed to. uh, And that didn't reach me either. And it wasn't until I was in my late 20s or 30s 
that my husband at that time, who was a teacher, um, he was going to be teaching religious classes in his English class. So he and his friend, who was also a teacher, um, went to church. And I went with them. And it, they had chosen, the one I chose with them, was a UU church. And I found that one interesting, partly because the minister spoke over my head. And I had to really think about things to make sense out of it. Um, and that I found interesting. And then I, uh, then I joined the choir, and then I decided to join the church, and things sort of went from there. And I'm still going from there. I come sometimes, and sometimes I don't. It's the way it is with me. Sorry. <laughs> that's, that's it. Well, the question speaks to our core values and what helps make us who, are, who we are. And for me, that came from my parents and my mother. And for the kids, you may not hear this very often, but from the time I was small, I remember my mother said, telling me, don't do what you're told. <laughs> so, <laughs> which actually it's more than that. It's a matter of just because somebody tells you to do something, whether it's your mother or your best friend or your teacher or that, it doesn't mean that it's right. Just because somebody tells you something, it doesn't mean that it's true. So think for yourself. Don't just do what you're told, but think first to decide whether it's true and whether it's right. My father was probably the one of the most loving and patient people I've ever known. And I remember he um, spoke to being non-judgmental. He always said, told me the Indian saying, don't judge anyone until you've walked a mile in their moccasins, or as he would put it, until you've walked a day in their moccasins. A um, couple of years ago, I was in a community organization. Um, somebody came up to me and said that there was a woman that was um, getting special privileges, and it wasn't fair because um, other people weren't getting them. I was in a um, position of some authority then, and so I went and I talked with the woman and got her to agree to give up those benefits. Um, I used some of my own personal funds to help um, make better arrangements for her to compensate it for her, compensate for her giving up those advantages. Um, and everything seemed okay, but some of her friends um, saw that, um, felt that she was hurt somewhat, and they thought I was being um, mean and hateful towards her. Um, and it's a matter of when we do things, they, things don't always turn out the way we want. When we do things, we see our intent, we know what we want, but when other people see things, often, often we, when other people do, see, do things, we just see the results, and we don't always um, see the intent behind it. So I want to suggest that before you, um, when you think somebody's not being very nice or is you don't like the way things are, to try and look behind things. Think, of, <clears throat> think about the intent that the person may have. Because usually, most people are doing the best they can 
And but we all make mistakes, and so, sometimes things just just don't turn, excuse me, turn out right. So, thank you. What what sustains you now? You again. Oh, okay. Um, thank you, Becca. What sustains you now? Meditation and prayer. That's the short answer, but I'm not known for my short answer. So when we first came to this church, we avoided words like prayer and meditation. If someone said they were praying for me, I'd say, and I'll be sending you good vibrations. People often complained about our funeral services that they'd be through the whole service and never hear the word God mentioned. And then there was that you, you joke. The last time the words Jesus Christ was spoken in the you, you church was when the janitor fell down the stairs. <laughs> Terrible, I know. I think we've evolved since those days. Many of us have no problem seeking a spiritual path. For me, it's a return to prayer and meditation. Also, spiritual reading. Currently, Marianne Williamson's many books on that topic. However, I have to admit, no matter how many spiritual practices, I don't see any improvement in myself. <laughs> Why do I have to follow her? <laughs> this is <laughs> uh, this was not an easy question for me um, because everything I'm saying is kind of like, oh yeah. I think the most basic thing that sustains me are the connections I make with friends, with family, the people I get to know. Some are here. A lot of them aren't here. Um, a lot of them used to be here. And then they left and moved away. Yeah, but so those were the connections with mostly my, my children, my husband, um, and our friends and the people here. Um, another thing that would, I say, sustain me or make me feel good is walking, walking in the woods, walking in a forest, walking in our, some of you know, the little little house, my, mother, my family home that we've moved into, which is surrounded by uh, trees and pathways, and being there and walking on the trails and sitting on the benches, um, it really is um, lovely. It really is a, a place that, that makes me happy. Um, reading, I spend a lot of time reading, um, not always very spiritual books, um, but just reading in general is also something that I think sustains me. And, of course, coming to church. But I think that's another question about what about the church sustains us. So I'll leave that for them. I, um, what sustains me now? Hmm. Well, coming here once in a while sustains me. I, it's... I can't come all the time. It's just too much for me. But, um, and I listen to other people speak and I think, oh, that's interesting. That's not me. <laughs> um, I do have some prayers and meditations that I say at home. Um, and that's, that's been more helpful than not. Um, what sustains me, I think, is my friendships with people from the church and without the church. Um, that, that helps me a lot, knowing people and getting to know them, seeing what, what makes them move and what makes them happy. And, um, that's, 
more what I am in favor of. I like being outside, so although I haven't done any walking for the last two or three years, um, I don't know, yeah. Um, but I do like being outside. And I, I like animals. I have two cats, and I used to have a dog, and well, I don't know. And I like people. So that's it. That's, that's basically it for me. Thank you. What sustains me now? Friends, you, family, caring for others. And I just have a general love of life. I just, I'm just in awe of existence and being alive and sustained by focusing on gratitude for just appreciating and being thankful for all my blessings. And, um, and especially friends and all the people who just helped me continue growing and becoming who I am. How is the church part of what sustains you? You're late. <laughs> okay. Um, how is the church part of what sustains you, Nate? You asked. Okay. Of the many ways our church sustains us, one of the best for me is the community. This church is filled with kind, generous, loving, and yes, holy people. To be with you, to spend time with you, is a gift beyond words. Just being in your company, rubbing shoulders with you, sustains me, and I love you all. Well, to answer what sustains me with the church, I think what I've always found here is almost like a support group for people who aren't in the traditional um, Christian religion. You know, when, when you have, uh, you know, friends that you meet and they ask you to join a prayer group and you're like, ooh, no, thank you. <laughs> That's not in my belief system. I think I feel much, much more comfortable saying that now than I used to. I mean, for... Younger people may not realize how much transition has taken place and how much more comfortable we can be expressing differences of opinions now. You know, in the, when I was a kid, if you said things like that, you um, were probably going, you know, parents would not want their kids to play with you. Um, but this church, has, I think, has given me that confidence and that support to be able to um, express who I am. And I really appreciate the, the people that are here, just as, as Pat was saying, there's a lot of loving, kind, um, caring people who we've known over many years, and that is what sustains me. <laughs> What I have appreciated about this church over the years is when I have been asked to be up here and do some reading or something, and I enjoy being part of the church and being part of its practice. Um, I can't say that I always believe everything we're saying, but um, it's, it's a good way to go. It's a good way to go. Um, Uh, I don't know what else to say. I'm just, I, I, I like everybody here. I don't think I've met anybody that I can't stand. Um, who knows? Um, so that's, that's a good thing. And I, I'm glad to see new people joining and stretching our bounds of who we are and what we believe. And um, I enjoy that part of it.
Um, I just momentarily just wanted to say I appreciate what everybody is saying. I, I love the responses of everyone. Um, uh, what sustains me now from this church is just community, is the, um, just all of you. Um, being here, connecting with you, it, church helps me maintain those connections. My covenant circle where I have a chance to interact on a closer level, deeper level than I do with lots of other people at other times, coffee hour here. I just appreciate this community and it just helps to say, helps, it supports me and I thank you. What are your special memories of the church? Something maybe brief. <laughs> brief? Well, well, special memories of my memories are many and varied. The Christmas Eve, listening to Emmy Lee Holmes playing the violin, and my growing family taking up a whole row and a half in the pews, I'm talking about. Okay. Um, and then the fun times in Fellowship Hall downstairs in the old church. I was special programs director for 12 years. We had dances, turkey trots, square dancing. On St. Patrick's Day, we did limericks and le leprechauns. The, the first person to mention, why don't we do a chili cook-off, was Theo Jean Kenyon. And look, we're still doing that tradition right now. Uh, once we had a laugh auction as a fundraiser. This is people told jokes and the audience would decide how much they thought the joke was worth. And then you'd pass the offering plates. I don't think we took in more than a nickel a joke. <laughs> then there were two groups that used to, there were bands that were led by UUs. One group was the Rusty Pickup Band, and that was Jim Hicks, Peggy Holmes, and their daughter, Emmy Lee, when she was just a little girl, played the fiddle. Oh, wait a minute, there's three groups, because Tim's sitting there, and he sometimes played. I don't know if you did in the old church, though, Tim. Okay, he did. So, three groups. Well, the other group was uh, a cowboy group led by Dale Goodner, and it was called the Bunkhouse Buckaroos. Well, I could never remember the name of that group. I knew they were cowboys, and every time I'd introduce them as the Buffalo Chips. <laughs> now, in the new church, I mourn the loss of some of the programs for the service the Native American Drum Circle, the Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead, service with the mariachis. And then I don't have time to tell you my favorite, I don't think, so I'll just end it here. Oh, encouragement? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, all right. Well, my best, oh, I can't do one sentence. It's, there's gonna be a lot of ands in it then. Okay, um, well, my memory is, the best memory I have was when we were dedicating my first grandchild, Michael. And the whole family is standing up there. We got to take over half the service, and um, we're getting our picture taken. And um, there is one of my daughters, Michelle, up there with a black eye. And the background to that is that um, we used to do after-school babysitting for a friend's daughter. And she would come in every day to pick up her child after school. One day she came up to me and she said, Pat, don't your kids ever fight? They're, it's so peaceful and they like each other. And I was so smug and I said, oh no, they never fight. They love each other. Well, it turned out Michelle borrowed without asking a blouse from Lizzie and it had Van Gogh's picture on the front. So she decided to make it more authentic. She cut the neck out raggedly. She cut the sleeves off 
And Lizzie knew nothing about this. So that's how she got her black eye. And I have that picture. And it kind of is a lesson, you know, not to be so smug. <laughs> because she, there it is in that memory. And that's all, I promise. <laughs> So I was, I'm going to cut down to one good memory that I have, and it involves Pat. So back in the old church, um, oh, what year did we think that was? In the 80s. Um, we're all sitting. It's a Sunday service, and we're sitting in the pews, and there's like a door opening in the back, and this woman starts shuffling in the door with a... Uh, <laughs> with stuff and with bags and like a scarf and just lots of clothes on and it's like shuffling down into the, the church, into the sanctuary. And she sits down next to um, one of our friends and who apparently she's told me was planted and sits down next to him, you know, with all her stuff and her clothes and looks at him, and I think he looks at her, and we're all like turning around going, what's going on? What is, what is this? And she gets up, and she moves, and she starts walking around again, and you know, everybody is paying attention by this time. Well, it turns out Pat was involved with a community program that, um, I don't know what the name of it was, but she was like impersonating a bag lady to try to develop people's awareness of who, who would be, who could be in that position? You know, what kind of people end up homeless or with, so she was going around to schools doing that and decided our church needed a lesson too. So that is one of my favorite memories. <laughs> Special memories of the church. Uh, hmm. I think I've always loved being at the church. Special memories? Gosh, I don't, it's hard to, I have been at church for, I've been at church for like over 20 years and it's like, oh, how can I think back that far? My mind doesn't work that way anymore. But I've always had fun in the church with the people because we do fun things and, and, we can always find something to laugh about. It doesn't matter who we are or where we're coming from. There's always something that we can laugh about. And I am very thankful for that because sometimes my life seems awfully boring. But church is not. Church is not. It's interesting. Thank you. Uh, some special memories I have at the church are basically of people. Um, when I first started coming here, there was an older woman named Dean Schnellschmidt. And she said um, at memorial services, flowers are wasted at memorial services. See. I get emotional sometimes, it's difficult. But anyway, let people know that you love them while, excuse me, while they're alive. Um, I also remember Betty Osborne didn't waste much time on small talk, it's a matter of life is short. Talk to people, um, if somebody's having a problem, get right to the point of it. Um, be there and connect with them. Another person was Kate McEwen. I joined the board of the church one time because she was on it. And she thought that Decisions shouldn't, should not be made just by majority rule, but by consensus that we should, we should work together 
and until we can get everybody to agree, not, not just the majority, but everybody. I have other memories of a group called Salon, but I don't want to take up your time now. So if you want, I can talk to you about that later afterwards. Thank you. Well, I want to thank everybody for participating, for being in the conversation, for letting us have the fullness of the conversation as well, and to Nate and Becca for being our question askers. In this way, we are developing and caring for one another, the exercise of listening and the reflecting and the cherishing of each other's lives in so many ways. So I want to thank Pat and Karen and Bob and Sherry for gracing us with your presence and your responses today. What a gift. Thank you very much. All right. And now I invite us to continue the conversation. This is meant as one moment one of many moments. And so we'll probably develop this and see where we go with further conversations as we go forward. And I think, I think by all means, ask more questions and follow up, I think, as we get to be social after the service today as well. And now, please join me in our closing hymn number 118, This Little Light of Mine. Please rise in body or spirit and sing with lift in spirit. <laughs> Let me invite Penny for our chalice extinguishing, sending our light into the world. We keep this light in our hearts by Maddie Sinfins. We extinguish this flame, but we keep the light in our hearts with its message of love and justice. We take it outside these walls of to the world we live in until we are together again. And let me invite El Kudanaway for our closing. Gathered Community by Gordon B. McKeeman. The worship, the worship of the gathered community is now ended. Go in peace, go in joy, go in love to share. In the ongoing worship of the community in desperation, carry with you what is precious to all. Reference for all life, beauty that displays itself in love. 
deep abiding peace. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. Thank you.